I'm Charlotte, and this is Quarantine Storytime. And we have been reading War and Peace during our shelter in place from COVID-19. And today we are picking up with volume three, part one. We're going to do 17, 18, and 19. And if you missed anything, feel free to check out the playlist. Subscribe to my channel so you can get updates on when we go live. I've been going live earlier in the day because um, there has been some reopenings where I am. So I've had to go back to work, which has been a uh, adjustment just to having to be someplace really early. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I've been posting this earlier so that you can all watch it whenever is convenient for you. Um, you can still watch it at the three o'clock like we were doing, or you can jump on with me whenever I'm live. Or you can save it for later on when you're trying to fall asleep and you just need to hear someone droning on about wars and random Russian intrigues. You know, whatever works. Um, so yeah, hope you're having a great week so far. And um, just want to remind everyone, I saw something and it was a really good reminder for me. Um, Brianna Taylor, uh, No, there's still been no arrests or any kind of like f official charges or filings in her case. And so, um, and as you recall, she's the EMT who was shot to death by police while sleeping in her own bed in her own home when they were trying to execute a warrant for someone who didn't live there and was actually already in police custody. So um, that's just, personally, I think it's a pretty despicable situation. Um, if nothing else, it's um, negligent homicide. The fact that they they were so uh, badly prepared for what they were actually supposedly supposed to be doing, um, and and now they can't even find the warrant to see who signed it or who issued it or anything. Suddenly, it's become it's mysteriously just disappeared in all of this confusion. Um, so there's, there's definitely some work to be done there. So, um, uh, just a reminder, you know, to continue to remember that and to continue to find ways to, um, challenge the authorities. I'm like, I mean, I'm not going to be prescriptive about how to do that, but there's, you know, always petitions or calling your Senator, calling, um, the, uh, the local leadership in, um, her town and just to remind them that the eyes of the nation, if not the world are on them right now, and that um, they have the moral imperative to do the right thing. So that's my thought on that. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy times we're living in, but if we can all find a little way to do something a little helpful for someone else, it'll go a long way. So, yeah. Uh, without further ado, let's jump back into War and Peace. And as you will recall, we were with the, um, the Army just uh, yesterday and following both Andrei Bolkonsky and then Nikolai Rostov's movements and new life with the Army now that Napoleon's invaded Russia or is invading Russia in, and we're in, in the year 1812. And then right before we closed out the day, we looked back in at Natasha Rostov, who had been rather sick after her whole um, affair with Anatoly Kurigan, an attempt to run off with him, and then the, her thereby breaking off her engagement with Prince Andre. She had become quite um, sick, like, seems mostly heart sick, but they spent plenty of money on doctors and um, even though uh, maybe the medicines and treatments they prescribed didn't actually do anything over time, the attention and over time, she seems to be getting better. So we'll jump back in there. Section War and Peace, part three, part, or volume three, part one, section 17. Natasha was more calm, but not more cheerful. She not only she not only avoided all external conditions of joyfulness, balls, promenades, concerts, the theater, but she never once laughed so that tears were not heard behind her laughter. 
She could not sing. As soon as she began to laugh or tried to sing when she was by herself, tears choked her, tears of remorse, tears of remembrance of that irretrievable time, irretrievable time of purity, tears of vexation that just so, for nothing, she had ruined her young life, which might have been so happy. Laughter and singing seemed especial, especially to especially seemed to her a blasphemy against her grief. Of coquetry, she never even thought. There was no need for her to restrain herself. She said and felt that at that time, all men were for her exactly like the buffoon Nastasia Ivanovna. An inner guard firmly forbade her every joy. And there were in her none of those former interests of life from the girlish, carefree, hope-filled life she used to lead. More often and more painfully of all, she remembered those autumn months, the hunting, the uncle, and Christmas time spent with Nicholas and Otrudno. What would she not have given to bring back just one day of that time? But now it was over forever. Her presentiment had not deceived her that the state of freedom and openness to all joys would never return again. Yet one had to live. It comforted her to think that she was not better as she had thought before, but worse, much worse than everyone, everyone in the world. But that was not at all. But that was not at all. She knew it and she asked herself, and what then? And then there was nothing. There was no joy in life and life was going by. Natasha clearly tried not only to not be a burden to anyone or to bother anyone, but for herself, she wanted nothing. She avoided everyone in the house and only felt at ease with her brother Petya. She liked being with him more than with the others, and sometimes when they were alone together, she laughed. She hardly ever left the house, and when those who came to see them, she was glad only of Pierre. It was impossible to, re to treat her more tenderly, more carefully, and at the same time more seriously than the Count Bazukov treated her. Natasha unconsciously felt that this tenderness of his treatment, and therefore unconsciously felt this tenderness of his treatment, and therefore found great pleasure in his company. But she was not even grateful to him for his tenderness. Nothing good on Pierre's part seemed to affect her, seemed an effort to her. It seemed so natural for Pierre to be kind to everyone that there was no merit in his kindness. Occasionally, Natasha noticed Pierre's embarrassment and awkwardness in her presence, especially when he wanted to do something to please her or when he was afraid that something in their conversation might lead Natasha to painful memories. She noticed it and ascribed it to his general kindness and timidity, which, to her mind, must be the same with her as with everyone else. After those inadvertent words that if he were free, he would go on his knees and ask for her hand and her love, spoken at a moment of such intense emotion for her, Pierre had never said anything about his feelings for her, and it was obvious to her that the words had, which had comforted her so much then had been spoken the way all sort of meaningless words are spoken to comfort a weeping, a weeping child. Not because Pierre was a married man, but because Natasha felt the highest degree in the highest degree, the strength of the moral barrier between them, the absence of which she had felt with Corrigan. It had never entered her head that her relations with Pierre might lead not only to love on her side, still less on his, but even to that sort of tender, self-aware, poetic friendship between a man and a woman, of which she knew several examples. At the end of St. Peter's Fast, Agrafina Ivanovna Belov, the Rostov's neighbor in Optrino, came to Moscow to venerate the Moscow saints. She suggested that Natasha prepare for communion, and Natasha joyfully seized upon the idea. Despite the doctor's prohibition on going out early in the morning, Natasha insisted on preparing, and preparing not as it is usually done in the Rostov's home, that is, by hearing three services at home, but as Ag Agrafena Ivanovna did it, that is, for the whole week without missing a single Vespers, liturgy, or matins. The Countess liked the zeal of Natasha's, and for... After the unsuccessful medical treatments, she hoped in her heart that prayer might help her more than medical than medications, and she consented to Natasha's wish, though with fear and concealing it from the doctor, and entrusted her to Ms. Mrs. Belov. Agrafena Ivanovna would come at three o'clock in the morning to wake up Natasha, and often and most often found her already up. Natasha was afraid to sleep through that time for mate for matins. Washing, hastily dressing, humbly in the po poorest of her dresses and an old mantilla, shivering in the fresh air, Natasha would go out into the deserted streets, transparently lit up by the glow of dawn. On, Agnef and uh, on Agrafena uh, Ivanovna's advice, Natasha went to the services not in her own parish, but in, in a church in which, according to the pious Mrs. Belov, there was a priest of quite strict 
and lofty life. In that church, there was always a f- always few people. Natasha and Mrs. Belov would stand in their usual place before the icon of the Mother of God built into the back of the left-hand choir, and a new feeling of humility would come into the be- over Natasha before the great, uh, the unknowable, when at this unaccustomed hour of morning, looking at the blackened face of the Mother of God, lit by candles in the light of the morning coming through the windows, she listened to the words of the service, which she tried to follow and understand. When she understood them, her personal feelings with its nuances joined with her prayer. She did not, when she did not, the sweeter it was for her to think that the wish in understanding everything was pride, that it was impossible to understand everything, that she only had to believe and give herself to God who in those moments she felt was guiding her soul. She crossed herself, bowed, and when she did not understand, only asked God in honor of her own vileness to forgive her for everything, everything, and to have mercy on her. The prayers she gave herself to most of all were prayers of repentance. Returning home at an early hour of the morning when she met only masons going to work and yard porters sweeping the street, and everyone in the houses was, was still asleep, Natasha experienced a new feeling of the possibility of correcting her vices and the possibility of a new, pure life and happiness. During the whole week in which she led this life, that feeling grew every day, and the f- happiness of taking communion or of commuting, of communicating, as Agrafena Ivanovna used to say, playing joyfully with the word, seemed so great to her that she thought she would never survive till that blessed Sunday. But the happy day came, and when Natasha, on that Sunday so memorable for her in a white muslin dress, came home after communion, for the first time in many months, she felt calm and not burdened by the life that lay ahead of her. The doctor came that day, examined Natasha, and said she should continue to take those last powders he had prescribed two weeks ago. Be sure to continue, morning and evening, he said, clearly pleased in all good conscience with his success. Only I beg you, don't. I beg you, be precise. Don't worry, Countess, the doctor said jokingly, catching the gold piece deftly in his soft palm. She will soon be singing and frolicking again. This last medicine is very good for her. She's quite refreshed. Hmm. Countess looked at her nails, spat at them for good luck, and went back to the drawing room with a cheerful face. Section 18. At the beginning of July... More and more alarming rumors spread in Moscow about the course of the war. There was talk of the sovereign's appeal to the people about the sovereign himself coming from the army to Moscow. And since up to the 11th of July, the manifesto and appeal had not been received, exaggerated rumors about them and about the situation of Russia went around. It was said that the sovereign had left the army because it was dangerous, that it was in Smolensk, that it It was said that Smolensk had surrendered, that Napoleon had a million troops, that only a miracle could save Russia. On the 11th of July, on Saturday, the manifesto was received, but not yet printed, and Pierre, who was at the Rostovs, promised to come the next day, Sunday, for dinner, and bring the manifesto and appeal, which he was to obtain from Count Rastupchin. That Sunday at the Rostovs, as usual, went to liturgy at the Ruzum, Ruzumovsky's house chapel. It was a hot July day. By 10 o'clock, when the Rostovs were getting out of the carriage before the church, in the hot air, the cries of the hawkers in the light and gay-colored summer clothes of the crowd, in the dusty leaves of the trees along the boulevard, and the sounds of the music and the white breeches of a battalion marching to change the guard, in the rattling of carriages over the cobblestones, and in the bright brilliance of the hot sun, there was already that summer languor that content and discontent with the present, which is felt especially strongly on clear, hot day in town. All the Moscow nobility, all the Rostov's acquaintances, were in the Razumovsky chapel. That year, as if expecting something, many wealthy families who usually went off to their country estates stayed in town. Walking behind the liveried footmen who made the who made way through the crowds before her mother, Natasha heard a young man's voice saying of her in much too loud a whisper, that's Miss Rostov, the one who, she's thinner, but still pretty. She heard or seemed to hear the names of Kurgan and Volkonsky mentioned. However, it always, however, it always seemed to her. It always seemed to her that everyone looked at her and thought only of what had happened to her. Suffering and with sickening, with a sinking heart as always in a crowd, 
Natasha walked into her walked in her violet dress with black lace as a woman as women know how to walk the more calmly and majestically the more pained and ashamed she felt at heart she knew she was pretty and she was not mistaken but that would did not cause her joy as it used to um On the contrary, it tormented her most of all lately, especially on this bright, hot summer day in town. On su One Sunday later, one week later, she thought to herself, remembering how she had been here last week Sunday, it's the same life without living, the same condition in which it used to be so easy to live. I'm pretty, I'm young, and I know that I'm good now that I was bad before, but now I'm good. I know it, she thought, and yet my best years are going to be for nothing, for nobody. She stationed herself next to her mother and exchanged words with acquaintances who stood nearby. Out of habit, Natasha studied the ladies' dresses, disapproved of the tenue of a lady near her, and the improper way she crossed herself with a quick little movement, again thought with vexation that she was being judged and that she herself was judging, and suddenly, hearing the sounds of the service, was horrified at her own vileness, Horrifying, horrified that the former purity was again lost to her. A, a seemingly gentle little old man was serving, who was serving with that meek solemnity which has such an exalting and soothing effect on the sounds of praying people, on the souls, sorry, of praying people. The royal doors closed, the curtain was slowly drawn, a mysterious gentle voice pronounced something from inside. Tears incomprehensible to herself rose in Natasha's breast and a joyful agonizing feeling stirred in her. Teach me what I'm to do, how I'm to set myself right forever, forever, how I'm to live my life, she thought. The deacon came out to the ambo, releasing his long hair from under his dalmatic with a, with a widespread thumb and making a cross on his breast began loudly and solemnly to read the words of the prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. As one world, all together, without distinction of rank, without enmity, but united in brotherly love, let us pray, thought Natasha. For the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls, for the word, world of the angels and the souls of all bodies and beings who dwell above us, Natasha prayed. When they prayed for the military forces, she remembered her brother and Denisov. When they prayed for those who traveled by land and sea, she remembered Prince Andrei and prayed for him, and also prayed that God forgive her the wrong she had done him. When they prayed for those who love us, she prayed for everyone at home, for her mother, her father, Sonia, now understanding for the first time all her guilt before them and feeling all the strength of her love for them. When they prayed for those who hate us, she invented enemies and those who hated her in order to pray for them. She counted as enemies the creditors and all those who had dealings with her father. Each time, at the thought of enemies and those who hate us, she remembered Anatole, who had done her so much wrong. And though he did not hate her, she joyfully prayed for him as an enemy. Only while praying did she feel herself able to recall, clearly and calmly, both Prince Andre and Anatole as people for whom her feelings were nothing compared to her feelings for, of fear and reverence for God. When they prayed for the Tsar's family and, and the Synod, she made especially low bows and crossed herself, thinking that even if she did not understand, she could not doubt, and all the same loved the ruling Synod and prayed over it. Having finished the prayers of petition, the deacon crossed his stole over his breast and said, Let us command ourselves and all our life unto Christ our God. Let us command ourselves unto God, Natasha repeated in her soul. My... God, I commend myself to your will, she thought. I want, I wish for nothing. Teach me what to do, where to make use of my will. Yes, take me, take me, Natasha said, with tender impatience in her soul, not crossing herself, but lowering her thin arms as if waiting for some unknown power to take her and deliver her from herself, from her regrets, from her dis despairs, reproaches, hopes, desires, and vices. Several times during the service, the countess turned to look at her daughter's face, touched by emotion with shining eyes, and prayed to God that he help her. 
Unexpectedly, in the middle and outside the order of service, which Natasha knew so well, a beetle brought out a little footstool, the same as was used for kneeling prayers at the Feast of the Trinity, and placed it in front of the royal doors. The priest came out in, a purple, in his purple velvet cap, smoothed his hair, and knelt with effort. Everyone did the same and looked at each other with perplexity. There was a prayer just... This was a prayer just received from the Synod, a prayer for the salvation of Russia from foreign invasion. Lord, God of hosts, God of our salvation, the priest began in that clear, unostentatious and meek voice which only clerg in which only clergy reading the Slavonic read and which affects the Russian heart so irresistibly. Lord, God of hosts, God of our salvation, look down now in mercy and compassion upon thy humble people. And in love for mankind, hear us, spare us, and have mercy on us. Behold, the enemy who confounds thy land and would lay waste the whole universe has risen up against us. Behold, lawless people are, have gathered together to destroy thine inheritance, to devastate thine holy, honorable Jerusalem, thy beloved Russia, to defile thy churches, to overthrow thine altars, to violate our holy places. How long, O Lord, how long shall sinners rejoice? How long shall the transgressors hold sway? O Lord God, hear us who pray to thee. Give thy strength to our most pious, autocratic, and great sovereign emperor, Alexander Pavlovich. Remembering his righteousness and meekness, reward him according to his goodness, by which he preserves us, thy beloved Israel. Bless his counsels, undertakings, and actions. With thine almighty right hand, uphold his kingdom and grant him victory over his enemies, as thou didst to Moses over Am Amalek, to Gideon over Midian, to David over Goliath. Preserve his army, place a bow, a, a bow of brass in the hands of those fighting in thy name. Gird them with the power to make war. Take up thine arms and shield and arise to help us so that thou, those who contrive evil against us be put to shame and disgrace. Let them be before thy face of thy faithful army like dust before the face of the wind, and let thy mighty angel discomfort them and drive them hence. Let the net they know let the net they know not of come upon them. Let the trap concealed from them ensnare them, so that they fall under the feet of thy servants and our warriors may trample upon them. Lord, let thy power save in gr things great and small, not be exhausted. Thou art God, let no man prevail against thee. God of our fathers, remember thy compassion and mercy from all eternity. Drive us not away from thy face, neither scorn our unworthiness, but have mercy upon us according to thy great mercy, and in abundance of thy compassion regard not our sins and transgressions. Create in us a pure heart and renew a right spirit within us, Strengthen us with all faith in thee. Establish us in hope. Inspire with us true love for each other. Arm us with oneness of spirit in righteous defense of the, the inheritance which thou hast granted to us and, thy, and our fathers, so that the rod of unrighteousness be not raised against the destiny of the sanctified. Lord our God, in, which, in whom we believe and place our trust, disgrace us not in our hope of thy mercy. Make a sign for the goods so that those who hate us in our orthodox faith may be put to shame and per perish. Let all nations know that thy name is the Lord, and we are thy people. Show us this day thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Make hearts of thy servants rejoice in thy mercy. Strike down our enemies and swiftly crush them under the feet of thy faithful. For thou art the defense, the succor, the victory for those who put their trust in thee. To thee we ascribe glory, to the Holy Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. In that state of inner openness in which Natasha found herself, this prayer had a strong effect on her. She listened to every word about the victory of Moses over Amalek, and Gideon over Midian, and David over Goliath, and about the destruction of thy Jerusalem, and asked God with the tenderness and softness with which her heart was overflowing, but she did not understand very well what she was asking God in this prayer. With her whole soul, she participated in the petition about a right spirit, with this, about the strengthening of the hearts with faith, hope, and inspiring them with love. But she could not pray about the trampling her enemies under her feet. For within, when, with, when within a few moments before, she had wished to have more of them so as to love them and pray for them. 
but she could not doubt the rightness of the kneeling prayer that was before that was being read. She felt in her soul the reverent and trembling fear before the punishment that comes upon people for their sins, especially upon her for her sins. And really sticky pages, I'm sorry, especially upon her for her sins and asked God to forgive them all and herself and grant them all and herself peace and happiness in life. It seemed to her that God heard her prayer. Section 19. Since the day when Pierre, leaving the Rostovs, and remembering Natasha's grateful eyes, had looked at that comet that hung in the sky and felt that something new had been revealed to him, the question that eternally tormented him about the vanity and folly of all earthly things had stopped presenting itself to him. That terrible question, why, what for, which used to present itself to him amidst every occupation, was now replaced for him, not by not by another question, not by the answer to the old question, but by her image. Listening to, a listening to a trivial conversation or engaged in one himself or reading or learning about the baseness of sen and senselessness of people, he was not horrified as he used to be. He did not ask himself why people made a fuss if everything was so brief and unknown, but remembered her the way he had seen her the last time and all his doubts vanished not because she answered the questions that presented themselves to him, but because her image immediately transferred him to a right, bright realm of inner activity in which no one could be right or wrong, into a realm of beauty and love for which it was worth living. Whatever vileness of life presented itself to him, he said to himself, well, let so-and-so steal from the estate and the czar and the state and the czar, and the state and the czar confer, czar confer honors on him. But yesterday she smiled at me, and asked me to come, and I love her, and nobody will ever know it, he thought. Pierre still went into society, still drank as much, and let, led the same idle and dissipated life, because besides the hours he spent at the Rostovs, he had the rest of the time to spend, and the habits and acquaintances he had acquired in Moscow drew him irresistibly to the life he was caught up in. But lately, when ever more alarming rumors kept coming from the theater of war, and Natasha's health began to improve, and she ceased to arouse in him the former feelings of protective pity, and anxiety he found more and more incomprehensible began to come over him. He felt that the situation in which he found himself could not continue for long, that a catastrophe was coming which was bound to change his whole life, and he impatiently sought signs of his approaching catastrophe in everything. One of his brother Masons revealed to Pierre the following prophecy concerning Napoleon derived from the Apocalypse of St. John. In the Apocalypse, chapter 13, verse 18, it is said, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred, three score and six. And in verse five of the same chapter, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking many things and blasphemies, and the power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. French letters give a numerical values like the Hebrew, in which the first nine letters represent units and the rest, tens, will have the following significance. A equals one, B equals two, C, D, E, F, G, H, I are nine, K is 10, L, L M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, is 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, and 160. Writing the words of Le Empire Napoleon in this alphabet of numbers, it turns out that the num sum of the figures equals 666, and that Napoleon is therefore that beast prophesied in the apocalypse. Moreover, if the words querent du, that is the term fixed for the beast to speak great things and blasphemies, is written in the same alphabet, the sum of these figures represents querent du, which again equals 666. From which, it, mm, from which it follows that the number, that the term of Napoleon's power had reached, sorry, from which it follows that the term of Napoleon's power was reached in the year 1812, 
when the, em when the French emperor turned 42. Pierre was very struck by this prophecy and he often posed that question for himself of precisely what would set a limit to the power of the beast, that is, of Napoleon. And on the basis of the same correspondence of word numbers and calculations, he wrote, he tried to find an answer to his question. An answer to the question, Pierre wrote out, Le Empereur Alexandre, Le National Russe. He counted up the letters, but the sum of the numbers came out much larger or smaller than 666. Once again, taken up with these calculations, he wrote his own name, Comte Pierre Bezukhoff. Bezukhoff. The sum of the numbers was also far from the right one. He changed the orthography, putting Z in the place of S, adding D, changing the article LE, and still did not get the desired result. Then it occurred to him that if the answer to the question he was seeking was contained in his name, then the answer would certainly mention his nationality. He wrote Le, Le Russe de Suhoff and counted the numbers, got 671. It was only five too much. Five was an E, the same E that dropped from the article in the words Le Empereur. Having dropped the E in the same way, albeit incorrectly, Pierre got the sought for answer, le Loros Bezuhoff, which equaled 666. This discovery, with, its, with that great event which had been pre predicted in the apocalypse, but he did not doubt the connection for a moment. Oh, sorry. This discovery excited him. He did not know how, but by what connection he was bound up with that great event which was predicted in the apocalypse, but he did, did, did not doubt that connection for a moment. His love for Miss Rostov, the Antichrist, Napoleon's invasion, the comet, 666, Le Empereur Napoleon, and La Russe Bezuhoff, all that together must ripen, burst, and lead him out of that spellbound, worthless world of Moscow habits in which he led, let, felt himself imprisoned, and bring to him a great deed and great happiness. On the eve of that Sunday when the prayer was read, Pierre had promised the Rostovs that he would bring them from Count Rastopchin, whom he knew well, both the appeal to Russia and the latest news from the army. And that morning, stop, stopping at Count Rastopchin's, Pierre found him found with him a just arrived courtier, courier from the army. The courier was an acquaintance of Pierre's from the Moscow ballrooms. For God's sake, can't you lighten it for me? said the courier. I've got a bag full of letters to parents. Among those letters was Nicol Nikolai Rostov's letter to his father. Pierre took it. Besides that, Count Rostopchin gave Pierre the sovereign's appeal to Moscow, only just printed, the latest orders to the army, and his own latest bulletin. Looking through the orders to the army, Pierre found that in one of them, amidst the information about the wounded, killed, and decorated, the name of Nikolai Rostov awarded the St. George, fourth degree, for bravery, shown during the Ostrovna action, and in the same order, and in the same order, the appointment of Prince Andrei Bolkonsky as commander of a regiment of cha chasseurs. Though he was reluctant to remind the Rostovs of, Bol of Bolkonsky, Pierre could not refrain from his wish to give them the glad news of their son's decoration and kept the appeal, the bulletin, and the other orders so as to bring them to dinner in person. He sent the printed order and the letters to the Rostovs. The conversation with Count Rostopchin his preoccupied and hasty tone, the meeting with the courier who told casually of things going poorly in the army, of rumors of spies found in Moscow, of a paper circulating in Moscow, which said that Napoleon promised to occupy both Russian capitals before autumn, of talk of the expected arrival of the sovereign the next day, all the, this aroused and renewed, with renewed force in Pierre, the feeling of excitement and expectation, which had not left him since the time of the comet's appearance, and especially since the start of the war. Pierre had long been thinking of entering military service, and he would have done so had he not been hindered first by his belonging to the Masonic order, to which he was bound by oath, and which preached eternal peace and the abolition of war, and second, by looking at the great number of Moscovites donning uniforms and preaching patriotism, which somehow made him ashamed to take such a step. But the main reason why he did not carry out his intention of entering military service service consisted in his vague notion that he, Los Bezuhoff, had the number of the beast, 666, that his participation in the great deed of setting a limit to the power of the beast, 
had it that spoke great things and blasphemies, was predestined for all eternity, and that he was therefore not to undertake anything, but to wait for what was to happen. And that is the end of our reading today. It's very interesting. Pierre has always been like in love with Natasha, so that's hardly surprising. Um, it's kind of funny too, because I feel like Pierre always finds an excuse for why he isn't going, like why he can't actively take part in life. Like he's always just sitting on the sidelines, like always something, you know, is not quite right. And so he'll just have to, or something, you know, or he has some presentiment. So he just needs to sit by. I think that, I feel like that's the story of Pierre's life. He always has a reason why he just is not an active participant. Um, it's interesting, the whole, um, a couple of things, just the fact that, you know, how at that time it would seem how, you know, they, there was all these ways to look at these prophecies and see all these things. But, you know, here, here now, you know, hundreds of years later, we're all still here and would, you know, argue that that was not what had happened or, you know, or, or a different interpretation of the, uh, the prophecies that they were seeing for themselves. And also that interesting thing, which I feel like happens in America, that they consider themselves like the new Israel, you know, this like, that we're a nation under God and that, you know, God will protect us and God has ordained for us to be victorious as if, you know, as if everyone is this, you know, wants to be the Israel. Um, and if everyone just somehow is because of, you know, whatever, what have you. I think it's very interesting. I mean, because it's it you you everyone wants to feel like their nation is the special one. Everyone wants to feel, you know, like that they have right and deity on their side. It's it's just I, I appreciated the uh, the depth of which he kind of took that that thought. And because he spent years writing this and rewriting it, I'm imagining it's it's almost it's funny because I'm wondering how much of this is like stuff he actually wrote down at the time, like the prayer that they added specifically because of the invasion. I wonder if he was in a service that day and was str struck by it and tried to write it down like later on, and remembering it and picking up these fragments from, you know, as he rewrote it years later and putting them all back in so that it's a novel, but it's also in some ways like a, a memoir of that, that specific time in Russia. So. It's interesting. I'm always very appreciative of all the detail he puts in. Anyways, sorry, I've been trying to take apart a sweater. I got, I picked up a lovely sweater that I didn't actually like, but I just got it uh, at a thrift shop and it's a cashmere sweater. I'm taking it apart for the yarn. So I've been working on it for days. It's a very complicated sweater to undo. So. Uh, but yeah. Hope you guys have a great day. Let's get justice for Brianna Taylor and um, let's stay smart and healthy out there. Clearly COVID-19 is not going anywhere for a while, so be safe. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.